Good evening, masters, fellows, and students. Welcome to today's communal dinner and dinner talk, presented by our distinguished visitor, Mr. Vikram Chandra, the best-selling author. I'm Rani Bar, the master of ceremony tonight. To begin the evening, may I now invite Professor Release to deliver an opening remark and start the goal. Professor Release, please. I hope your remark is to say that you don't have to sit and listen to me for very long. I'm going to tell you more about Vikram Chandra later, just before he, he speaks. But uh, we will have dinner first. Uh, I think you will find this very fascinating. So he's somebody who did courses in creative writing, then did creative writing, and then he teaches creative writing. So that, that's clearly a subject that works. He attended film school at Columbia, and later on the, an MFA in creative writing from Houston, University of Houston. Teaches at Berkeley. Now, Chandra has published several works of fiction. The biggest is Sacred Games, which I'm reading at the moment. I thought I'd be finished by now. Oh, it's good. I strongly recommend it. Um, it's 900 pages, and it took him seven years working on it. So uh, perhaps I'm forgiven. Rather a long time to read it. His fiction explores the overlaps between tradition and popular culture in both Indian and Western civilization. And the books are up in the student common room if you want to look at them. Most recently, he published Geek Sublime, described in a review in The Guardian, a British newspaper, uh, as a techno artistic memoir. 
I'm not sure you like that term. Fascinating, not beautiful. I haven't got to see it that time. Looking forward to it. In Geek Sublime, he casts a skeptical eye on modern coding, programming, for, for computers, reminding us, among other things, that the world's first computer programmers were women. And you know, I can't miss the chance to mention that when I was a student in Cambridge, in the Department of Applied Economics, there was a room, and on the door it said computers, and they were women. Tonight he's going to talk about, I don't know what it's referring to, Chitron, the poetry of the play, that he will, of course, explain. Thank you, Professor Willis. May I now invite our guest speaker, Mr. Sandra, to deliver the talk, please. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me just make sure we have our all our pieces of tech working. As Sir James said, uh, my last book is called Geek Sublime, and it's a book about writing computer code and writing fiction, which uh, I happen to do both. Um, and among the things that I explore in that book uh, is the connection between the classical Indian language Sanskrit and the modern world of um, And in, in a very odd way, uh, there is a connection. There was a grammar for the Sanskrit language that was written in about 500 BCE that is actually not a grammar in the sense that you and I would think about. It's an algorithm. It's a set of rules that runs um, on, on uh, syllables, on words, and produces language. And from that grammar, um, hundreds of years later, came much of what we now know as modern linguistics. So the idea of generating a language like we do in code, artificial languages, has a great deal to do with ideas learned from that. But instead of telling you about that, I'm going to talk to you about some of my current work that I'm doing. Uh, while I was writing that book, I got very fascinated by the playful projects that computer programmers were making, the art that they were making. Um, and of course, uh, I'm sure some of you in this room have done this, you use computer code to make beautiful things. Right? You've produced art by making code. But what I was also particularly interested in, because I'm a fiction writer, and I, uh, it's my job to pay attention to language, is the question, can computer code itself be beautiful? Can you make art out of the code itself? And it turns out that that some programmers have done exactly that. Now, this is one of my favorite pieces. It's by a guy called Ben Fry. And what he did was he actually took the code of one of those old Atari games that he used to come on a carpet, and he printed the code, as he says, in a column, right? And those of you who are programmers will know that in some programming languages, there is a go-to instruction, right? So, in BASIC, for instance, if on line 40 of the program you write go to 10, it'll jump to page 10, right? And so every time he saw a go to instruction, he drew a line between where the instruction was and where the target was. So here's another one. And if we blow this up a bit, you can see what he's doing, right? So that's the actual um, assembly code, assembly language code. And wherever there's a go to, he starts a line and then he points it at the target. And this is the actual code taken from uh, a game called Book Halo 2600, which is a very successful and popular game. So I really like this because what it takes, what it does is it asks us to think about language in a new way, right? And it takes computer code and out of that object makes something beautiful. Now, as it turns out, in Sanskrit, there is a great tradition of making poetry out of language so that the poetry itself becomes a visual statement. And they refer to that in a general sense, all those kinds of poems as chitra, 
Chitra literally means picture. So the meaning of Chitram is picture poetry. So I want to show you a couple of these. So this is a Sanskrit, some Sanskrit verse from the 7th century. And it's fairly uh, ordinary verse. If this is a battle scene that's being described. The army is very efficient, and as it moved, the warrior heroes were very alert and did their duties, etc., etc. So the brave soldiers going off the battle. And it looks completely ordinary until you start to look at it a bit more closely. Right? And what you do is, if you take the same lines and you pull apart the syllables, right? you take each line and you draw the syllables apart, and you stare at it for a while, you start to notice an interesting thing. If you draw this line and read along the line, sa se na gamana ramde. You see what, what that is? That's actually the first line. Right? So the poem, in a strange way, in a holographic kind of way, has its own line inside itself. Right? So let's draw another line and read along that line. Rasena sidana ratha. See that? That's the second line. And the third, and the fourth. Right? So it's a strange kind of uh, inward reflection, so that the poem, in a sense, in includes itself again. Right? Uh, it's one single act of recursion as a computer programmer may think about it. Now, does anybody see a picture in that? Do you see the pattern? It's hard, but. What they thought of, what it looked like to them, was this. Right. So that is known as the drum form. So there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these forms. Right? So they drew wheels, they drew chariots, they drew swords, animals. Right? And all by doing this very clever construction of language so that syllabically, when you pulled it apart, you would observe these patterns. In it, right? And you can see why this reminded me of Ben Fry's work, because this again the same notion of linearity that is embedded inside language and is made to do some extra work. So they did some more interesting stuff. This is a poem from the 6th century, another battle scene, right, in which there's a general who's cursing at his troops, despicable powers he's calling them, um, and, you know, he's talking about one time when they used to be brave, but they're not brave anymore. And again, you have the same, if, you, if you're familiar with Sanskrit, or if you look at the English, it doesn't seem like very remarkable stuff going on here at all. But again, if we take it and pull it apart like that, take and pull apart each of the syllables, and then we do a mirroring operation on it, which is to say, along the x-axis, along the bottom, we just mirror all the lines downward. Right? Then suddenly, interesting things start to happen in that. Let's read from the very bottom right corner upwards. Devakana Nikava De. See that? That's the first line of the poem. If you go over one column to the left and now read downwards, Vahikwa Sa Swa Kahiva. That's the second line. And the third and the fourth. Right. So again, there's a kind of weird way in which the poem makes itself again within it. And what's interesting about this is that if you look at this for a little while, you start to see that there's all kinds of directions that you can go in. Right? So for instance, start reading from the bottom left. Right? Devakani uh, Nikava De. Right? That again is the same line as the first line. Go up one column, read now to the left. Vahikwa Swa Swa Kahiva. That's the second line. So what they call this was good or auspicious in all directions. Which is to say that you can read this poem in all kinds of interesting directions. And a modern scholar has pointed out that this is actually something that has been observed in mathematical theory. Uh, it's a diagonal symmetry called D4 in group theory, the symmetry of a square that can be flipped or about a vertical axis or rotate to 90 degrees. So it's quite I don't know about you, but I find it quite amazing <laughs> the way we're able to do this kind of stuff. Right. All right, so let's go back to computer code for a little bit. Now, this is actual computer code. 
It's written in the language Perl, P-E-R-L. A lot of websites are made from Perl, which is a scripted language. And this is part of something, a, a game that programmers play called Code Golf. And the urge in Code Golf, or the task in Code Golf, is to take a task and do it in the least number of letters or characters. So I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard that song, 99 Bottles of Beer on the Wall. What this little piece of code does is that it prints out the entirety of that song. And the remarkable thing about it is that it's been done in 162 characters. Right? So that's the effort with code golf. The, the less space that you occupy, the, the more amazing it is, right? And the more virtue there is in the code itself. So, last week, guys, did something of the same sort. Here is a verse built with only two consonants, b and r. Right. And you notice that the entire verse is two words, right? And the reason that happens is that Sanskrit has word compounding, um, like German does, so that you can take a bunch of words and then stick them all together and they become one word. So what happens with this is when you pull the compound words apart, it becomes what's on the latter half of that page, and then it tells you that you know, what if it, you can make the sense of the, of the poem itself, right? But poets are competitive, right? So if somebody's going to write a poem, an entire poem in two syllables, somebody else is going to write a poem which only uses one concept, right? So here's an entire poem that has only the consonant ya. And the compound split, like we did in the last one, and then it becomes this incredibly intricate statement about devotion. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, you know, and, and I have to say that one of the reasons that Sanskrit lets people do stuff like this is that word order is fairly very loose, so that it doesn't matter where you put the subject and where you put the verb, you can change the order. And then also, in Sanskrit, you're allowed to take verb roots and invent your own words out of those roots by putting them together with others, right? So Himalaya, for instance, right? The name of Himalayas, the name of the mountain range, that's actually a compound word. Him is snow, and Alay is a boat. Therefore, when you put the two of them together, they become a boat of snow, right? Therefore, the mountain range. But in Sanskrit, it's completely legal if you wanted, if that didn't fit your metrical scheme in a poem that you were writing, if you use some other words, instead of ally for abode, if you use ghar for home, you could equally well call the mountain range that, right? As long as the context made clear to the audience what it was that they were talking about. So what, what these poets are doing is using all these flexibilities in a very clever way, using obscure constructions and managing to do stuff like this, right? And of course, uh, I hope you notice that the writer here is calling himself the lion of poetry and logic. <laughs> I'm quite willing to give him that. <laughs> so he was both a poet and a musician. All right, back to computer code. Now this is Perl code again, which is to say that it's a poem written in Perl, which is a coding language, which if you give to a Perl compiler, a compiler is a program that takes human readable code and turns it into binary code. So if you hand this over to a Perl compiler, this will actually compile. So the, the interesting thing about this is that it's actually computer code, but it manages to look like human code as well, right? Or human language, that I should say. But the, the writer here is kind of cheating. Uh, if on that first line, you'll notice that there is each window and exit. That and exit actually causes the compiler to ignore all the other words that follow. So it's not very clever, right? But it, this is actually a very famous poem. It was uh, in the computer programming world. Uh, it was one of the first or early examples of people trying to do this kind of thing. And this was published in 1990 by a guy called Larry Wall, who's one of the inventors of the Perl language. So, you know, it's interesting, but maybe not so smart. But this fairly ugly looking page of gobbledygook, that's more, this is more interesting. Now, this is an effort to make what 
programmers call polyglot programming, which is to say that this is one single file that you can hand to the compilers for seven different languages, and it will compile in all of them, right? Uh, so you can hand it to a Fortran compiler, it will work. You can hand it to the JavaScript compiler, it will work. Um, and I'm sure you're wondering what all that ook, ook, ook stuff is in there. That's actually, there is a language, an esoteric joke language written, invented by someone called ook, <laughs> which is supposed to replicate the call of an orangutan. And the only instructions in ook are ook followed by punctuation stops. Right? And it only has eight instructions, but it's Turing complete, which means that you can write in it anything that you could write in another line. So this is a clever way of constructing computer code so that it all works. And the reason that it works is that some languages will treat those. Um, you notice on the, maybe what is it, the sixth line down where it says include stdio. The, the character at the beginning of that, that check mark, is understood by many of the languages as being a common character, right? So when the compiler comes across that, it just ignores it. All right. Let's go back to Sanskrit world for a moment. So I'm going to say a phrase, a bunch of words, and I want you to think about it and uh, tell me what you hear. The cross-eyed bear. Now, if you hear this, some of you, I'm sure, must have heard that. But did somebody hear this? Right? Now, the truth is that you actually heard neither of these things. What you actually heard was this, right? Which is to say a string of phonemes in a continuous stream that came into your ear. This, by the way, is international phonetic alphabet which is what is used by linguists to denote sound, right? To write down the exact description of sound. So what happens is you hear that continuous string of phonemes and then under your consciousness, your brain does a bunch of operations and you hear either one or the other, right? And there is ambiguity in that, right? And so the decision about what the meaning is is often settled by context, but it can go either way. And notice also that in that second sentence, the cross I would bear, there is a contraction that makes it possible. Right? So that contraction, the change from I would to I, is what is known as a euphonic combination by linguists. Right? And the official name for it in modern linguistic theory is Sandhi, which is actually a Sanskrit word, because this was first described by Sanskrit linguists. And Sandhi means coming together. Right? So when two words come together and change the sound between them, that's a euphonic combination for Sandhi. And this happens all over the place in Sanskrit. Right? Um, literally every sentence will have some euphonic combination going on, and this sometimes creates ambiguity. Right? So if you hear that sentence on top, on top, riksha ihis iha tishtiti, the way that you pull that apart to make sense of it can result in two results. It can either mean the tree stands here, or he stands here in the tree. Right? depending on how your brain chooses to interpret that, depending on context. So you could say that this is a fault in language, right? In the way that all human languages work, but Sanskrit, because of the way that it's constructed, especially does that. But the poets, of course, look at this and say, hey, here's an opportunity. Let's try and do something clever with this. So here's a poem from the sixth century. And the situation here is that the hero has had a quarrel with his lover, so he sent another woman, a young woman, to act as a go-between. And what she's gone is gone and told the angry woman, not prone to anger, you're surely at your best when kind to others. Which seems like a good thing to say to somebody who's angry at their boyfriend, right? But you can also hear it as, surely it is because you are angry and unkind that you ended up lonely and miserable. And you can hear it, as, oh, angry one, being godless, you're surely lonely and miserable. But that's me. And then, but you can also hear it as, when you're soulless and cannot help being angry, you're surely a kind of crack. <laughs> that's getting really vicious. Right? So this is called four-target poetry. Right? In other words, you use the same sentence, the same construction, to simultaneously mean four different things. In this poem, there are places where people have observed seven-target poetry. Right? But the same 
syllabic construction actually means, can mean seven different things. So this is very exciting, and they actually give it a name. They call it Shlesha. Shlesha means literally embrace, but what it comes to be to mean is the poetry of simultaneous meaning. And this gets to be very, very popular for 1,500 years, and people do all kinds of fun stuff with it. So here, this is from the Mahabharata, the great epic. And here, there is a, a queen who is in disguise in King Virata's court. And his brother-in-law is attracted to her and is making sexual propositions to her. So she gets very angry. And she says to the king, I resorted to you believing you to be a worthy refuge, right, who is committed to his country and who can punish his stuff. So she's telling off the king because she's being harassed in his court. But at the same time she's doing that, she's actually talking to her husband, who's also in disguise, and who hasn't tried to protect her. Right? And what she's saying to him is, I married a disgraceful vessel made of unbaked pottery. So here, the double meaning becomes really interesting in a character kind of way, right? Because you can have these situations where you have a character who's speaking one way to one person, but at the same time is speaking another way to another person. Here's one more Shlesha poem. This is a devotional poem. I bow down to the Lord, the one sporting with Sri splendidly for eternity. So this is a hymn to the god Rama. Right? I'm sure you've heard of Rama from the Ramayana. Now here, if you start reading from the bottom up, right, upside down as it were, something interesting happens. You actually get a complete other verse. Right? Does that make sense? So the last two words in the first version are yodhe vase, right? which becomes seva dheyo. And similarly, the entire, all of the lines together, they mean something entirely different when read in the other way. That read the other way, read upside down, it becomes a hymn to the, to the god Krishna. Right? And this is a 30, there's 30 of these verses and as you read through them, if you read it forwards, it is a hymn for, to Rama. If you read each verse backwards, it's a hymn to Krishna. <laughs> now, this is pretty mind-blowing stuff. I don't know if you think so, but it's pretty astonishing to me. Right? And probably one of the most popular ones is this one, which is from the 12th century. So this tells the story from the Ramayana. And this is a battle scene in which the hero Arjuna, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is Ramayana, it's a battle scene in which the monkey god Hanuman has been can captured by the demon king. The demon king, who is really evil, uh, sets his tail on fire, right? And what he doesn't realize is what Hanuman is going to do, he goes into the city and sets the whole city on fire, right? So that's what this is referring to. But with just a little change in the order and the intonation of the words, you can actually see, read that as a scene from the Mahabharata. Okay? And this is 60 verses long. And in one version, it tells the story of the Ramayana. In another version, it tells the story of the Mahabharata. Right? And what is marvelous about it is that each of the scenes, in some ways, is connected. Right? So in the Mahabharata scene here, then Hanuman sounded his terrifying roar. Now, this is uh, the hero Arjuna has a flag, and on the flag there is Hanuman. Right? So they're both battle scenes. So there are two meanings here, but what the poet is able to do is by carefully arranging the way that the two meanings work next to each other, he creates a third meaning. Right? Because in a sense, the two aspects of the poem are commenting on each other. Right? They, they become ironic. So again, I, it's, it's pretty amazing, this, this thing. Um, um, uh, Yigal Bronner, who wrote a book called Extreme Poetry, observed about this poem is that it's as if somebody decided to tell the Iliad and the Odyssey together in the same sentences, but not only that, managed then to have the construction worked out so that the scenes from the Odyssey and the Iliad were commenting on each other, right? Were somehow mirroring each other. Um, so what the Sanskrit poets did was to take ordinary language and make it multiple, right? To take it and make it mean many things at the same time. 
And like I said, both the traditions of the picture poetry that we saw earlier and this shlesha, which is this, this uh, simultaneous meaning poetry, was very, very popular. Um, all the way until the colonial times when the tradition started to break. But still, the last great Shlesha poet who wrote in Tamil died in the very early 20th century. The interesting thing is that this, these traditions haven't been studied very much. Right? If there are Indians in this crowd, I bet there you've never heard of this stuff. Right? Or you've had the slightest impact. And the reason is that during the colonial times, the critics from the West who came into encounter with this poem, with these poetry, with this poetry, didn't like it very much. So this is a very famous, prominent German Indologist, a scholar, who is going off <laughs> about this poetry, and he's being very disapproving. Right? And part of the reason for this disapproval is that that was the height of romanticism. So what the virtues of poetry in that time in the West were that you were sincere, that you expressed feeling, right? So if any of you have read Wordsworth, that's what you were supposed to be doing in poetry. So this is the exact opposite of that. It's not about feeling. It's about the exercise of language. It's about doing wonderful things with language. And so in the 18th and 19th century, the study of this kind of poetry was removed from the academic curriculum. So this is actually a professor from a very famous and prominent college in Bombay in the mid-19th century who's rather proudly saying that they have removed all of this from the curriculum, right? Because it's monstrous, right? So it's interesting that the language that they use is all, it's all about monstrosity. It's about jungles, right? It's, it somehow suggests that there is something evil about this poetry. But what is the poetry actually doing? Right? Why is it pleasurable? If you ask the writers of the poems, they would have told you a couple of things. They would have said that they like doing it in a devotional space because of the great effort that you used to make a hymn like this showed your devotion to the God or gods. They also wrote a lot of battle scenes like this, and I actually had one pundit or scholar in India tell me the difficulty that you have reading this is the difficulty that the warrior is having during the battle. So it sort of makes you reflect on that. It's, like a, it's, a, it's a little bit stretchy for me. I'm not sure if I quite want it. But I think finally the reason that both the computer people and the Sanskrit people set themselves these very difficult tasks is that somehow the constriction is actually what makes the poetry great. The more rules that you set for yourself, the narrower space that you have to work in, the more pleasure there is in both the constructions but also in the reception. And so I would argue that what encountering this kind of work does to you is make you have a sense of wonder. All of a sudden, you start to see language in ways that you haven't seen it before. And you become aware of its immense possibilities and its power. And so I would, that's what I want to end with is Stravinsky on this idea. And he says, the more constraints one imposes, the more one frees oneself of the chains that shackle this way. So in other words, what he's saying is, a game is no fun unless it has rules. Right? And the more rules that you set for yourself, the more fun you're going to have. And in fact, the constraints become liberating. Thank you. We will now have a Q&A session. May I now invite Professor Merlis to come to the stage and be our host of this session. To pose a question, please feel free to raise your hand. Punctuate it in a different way. Right. It means something good, it could mean something bad. It, it, my mind is not blank to give you an example. Right. 
that's wonderful to hear. I mean, people have the same impulses, right? So, I mean, um, in the 20th century, concrete poetry, in other words, poetry which made visual patterns, became a very strong movement in Europe and Brazil especially. And this idea of, of simultaneous meaning has been explored in other languages as well. So I think it's an impulse that a lot of people have, and the way that we express it depends upon the grammar that, and the syntax that you have available. But, but I, 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 I was wondering how you would read that one syllable form that you know, in a poetry reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that brings up the interesting question of um, who was the audience that was listening to this, right? And Bronner um, points this out in his book, and I think he's quite correct in saying that it requires a very, very educated audience to be able to appreciate this. And you can actually see that in historical terms in the number of dictionaries and lexicons that are produced from about 800 um, CE right on down to the 18th century, right? So that the audience or the sophisticated people who are practicing this kind of poetry and listening to it have to have a certain kind of education in order to be able to appreciate it. So it requires a very high order of familiarity with not just conventional Sanskrit, but all the intricacies, all the elusiveness that they use. In order to get all that, they have to be a very polished kind of person. And in some sense, that is reflective of the environment that this book came out of, is that um, the people who did this were urban sophisticates, right? often somehow connected to the local court, whatever that was. And the poets who were practicing this were often doing it within that context. Um, and apparently, they used to be in a social gathering, right, this would be one of the amusements, right? Handing each other difficult poems and asking the other person to interpret or understand it. And if you could, you know, if you had a rival or something, somebody that you wanted to uh, disgrace, if you handed him something that, or her something that they couldn't do, you won, right, in a sense. So it was also very important in the social context, right, that uh, you were able to do this. And the Kama Sutra, um, which is a great manual about sex and love, so forth, um, actually lists this as uh, this kind of poetry as one of the talents of a very great courtesan. Okay, he doesn't know how to do this. Right? <laughs> then I can do one myself. Okay. Of course, uh, what uh, struck me was the, the in mathematics, uh, in recreational mathematics. Things like this, uh, Latin squares. Well, there must be some reason why it's called the Latin square. You know, you have to get pattern of numbers in, in the square uh, to be the same way to add up the right number. And actually, Sudoku, is, which is not something I've ever tried to do, but, uh, but seems to be very popular in, in some countries. Where uh, you impose certain constraints. I, 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 I was just thinking that probably to appreciate these things, presumably you have to have tried to do it yourself. Right. Right. Or, or, of course, I was thinking in the mathematical conference, uh, there's not much point in reading a mathematical proof and finding it useful unless you try to do it yourself. Right. No, I, um, I think your awareness of the degree of difficulty is really important, right? Of, of, of the thing that you're looking at, of the object that you're looking at. Um, um, like I was saying, in the 20th century, there's been a kind of resurgence of this kind of work in Europe and in the United States as well. Um, of course, I'm going to forget the name of the author and the book, but there's a movement called Ulipo, right, where the writers who belong to that movement set themselves these arbitrarily difficult tasks. So one of the most famous achievements of that movement is a 300-page novel in, in French in which no word that includes the letter E is ever used. <laughs> And the most more amazing thing is that somebody managed to translate that into English without any ease. Right? 
it's quite unbelievable. I, I actually respect that second one, I think, a little more than the, the first one. But um, the interesting thing about that is that uh, I actually met one of these uh, the great um, stalwarts of the political movement um, last year. And he said something that's very true. He said, if you didn't know that that's what the novel is doing, it would be a very boring novel. Right? So there's some sense in which the missing E, the knowledge of that, is essential. Without that, you don't get the pleasure, you don't get the one. Right? That this that would feed the nature of doing it. Um, and I'm sure you're right that, that uh, this is why, I guess, the jokes of one discipline don't transfer very well to the next one. Because if you make a joke about a theorem, I'm probably going to have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> and I, I was reflecting that uh, I might put it this way, although since I'm very keen on mathematics, I'm not quite right. But in mathematics, people might accept these problems of single to life problems of more elegant than the single to life uh, Because this kind of mathematics is obviously not the same. So you, you're straight on to uh, appreciating the pattern of the past. Whereas with poetry, uh, it's the reaction of these German scholars, mm -hmm. and Elkins from Collier. Right. Uh, 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 they didn't think poetry was politics. Right. Uh, perhaps they, they felt it was too serious to be played with. And of course, the insight that you're putting over is that uh, there's something wrong with that from a Victorian point of view. But if things matter, there's no sense of humor on the board. Right. Well, I mean, the, the Shakespeare was right. Well, the positioning of this kind of poetry is interesting. Uh, so, within the Indian literary tradition itself, this was supposed to be the least virtuous of both the poetic norm, right? So, so what they were interested in, um, which I'll talk about tomorrow, was poetry which had a great deal of feeling and resonance and depth, right? So that the poem which you could read a thousand times and keep discovering new meanings was the poem that was held to be the greatest poem, right? And this was, as the title had it, it's the poetry of play. It's, it's only for the pleasure of play. It doesn't even assume necessarily that it's going to do anything more than that. And there isn't that idea of play that is something that is, has to do with uselessness. Um, in other words, a game is most a game when it doesn't matter at all, and that's why it becomes deadly serious and important. Right? If you think about that, right? Like, why do we react so much to cricket matches and to football matches? I mean, in what context does that really matter? But people are willing to kill each other over these things. So the profundity of the game operates because it's completely useless, and because it operates within a system of rules. But if you're unable to see that, I think, then it seems completely pointless to you, right? It seems completely frivolous. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, I'm sure you're right, that, that the idea that those guys had about what poetry should do was to make words what they claim about, you know, and truth and one's relationship to nature and so uh, So the idea of play as play was something I think that was very offensive. Well, to some extent, I think we're here to play. As an economist, I mean, consumption matters just as much as production. You be more, because the whole point of the thing is consumption, as play. But when, like we we are reading or writing some poem, what do you think is most more important? Like the song of the poem, like William Shakespeare's sonnet, or the uh, format of the poem? Thank you. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, I think that the the tradition, as it were. So the Sanskrit um, or the South Asian literary theorists spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, 
what is it that actually makes a poem beautiful? Is it the sound? Is it the rhythm? Is it the form? Or is it the meaning? And I think for me, the most satisfying answer they came up with was when all of those are working together, that's when you get a really, really good poem. Right? So in other words, there's a point at which um, the sound and the rhythm in a poem enforces or reinforces the meaning. And that, as a writer, I can tell you, is the most satisfying feeling. When you can change the rhythm of a sentence, and then by emphasizing something, you can actually, just by using formal qualities, you can actually make it come alive. Um, I'm trying to think about an example. And since you mentioned Shakespeare, I think the one that's coming to my mind right now is from Macbeth. Um, uh, and it's... Um, it's a line that Macbeth says, and I'm going to mangle it, but it's something like um, he's talking about killing somebody, his enemies, and he says, um, I will the multitudinous seas in Connerdine make the green one red. Right. So, so what's interesting about that is that he's repeating the exactly the same sense both times, right? I will the multitudinous seas in Carnadine. Right? He's going to make it red, but then he says, I will make the green one red, the green one being the sea. Right? And I think the reason that it's so so amazing is because first you get the multisyllabic richness of those Latinate words, you know, the long words that the rhythm is like this, and then there's the abruptness of the Anglo-Saxon, make the green one red. Right? And if you watch a good actor do that speech on stage, it is amazing because that make the green one red comes with this shock where you recognize that what he's talking about is murder. And so, um, I think in those moments, that's, I think, what, what you really, as a writer, are reaching for. You aren't always able to get there, but uh, I think that those are the wonderful moments. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm you, and I have a quick question, which is, um, out of all these chapters and all these um, uh, poems, poets, which your favorite form and which is your favorite poem I would have to say that um, the one that we saw right here, Kaviraja, I think what he does is quite amazing, right? In that in that the simultaneous telling of two stories in which both stories are echoing each other. Right? And um, if you know the Mahabharata and the Ramayan, um, people have observed for a long time that there are a lot of so the two works are linked together anyway. So what he's doing, in a sense, is making a comment on that that linking, right? On that juxtaposition. Um, and um, my Sanskrit is very shaky. I read mostly in translation. I had two years of Sanskrit at school, and I ran away from it because the way they taught it was just the pushes. It was felt to me like the most boring thing ever. I'm trying to now reteach myself. But when I read his stuff, even in the Sanskrit, it seems to me that his language is more flowing and natural than some of these other guys who, because they have to get a certain syllable into a certain place, twist it, right? They have to make it work so that the words will come in the right place. But his stuff feels entirely natural. Um, and by the way, um, his name, Kavi Raja, he gets it himself, he's the king of the poets, right? He calls himself that. And, I, you know, uh, he's another guy I'm going to get that to. Or at least if not king, maybe at least a prince, right? Of some sort. Uh, so I like this stuff. Um, yeah. I think we should finish now. Right? Okay. Finish by several things. Just thank you very much for fascinating, most unusual. Uh, I feel so interesting. Let's say you, you didn't mention uh, the sort of uh, puzzle that like some uh, makes a little more sense and what is equally important. Creating a program to write itself. Yes. Yeah. Oh. This is uh, it's another yeah. example of your science. Puzzles are a new kind of things. And not as new as I thought. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay and receive a souvenir presented by Professor Merlees on behalf of Morningside College. Professor Merlees, please. Mr. Chandra, thank you.